Daniel 12, 3. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Over the last handful of weeks, we've been watching Paul and studying what Paul did when it comes to evangelism. And he has shown that our attitudes when facing the circumstances that we face in life, whether it's the good, the bad, or the ugly, it can influence those folks that are around us because we're supposed to reflect Christ. And if we reflect Christ and accept that God is in control, then other people around us will come and they will ask the questions necessary. After last week's incident in Athens, Paul showed you don't have to have that Bible memorized front to back. What was it that he did? He gave basic, basic examples. He said that there is a creator of the world and all the heavens and everything in it, which referenced God. He said that all people came from one man, which was Adam, and all the people in the world came from another man and his family, which was Noah. And then he went on to kind of talk a little bit about Jesus. He didn't go into great detail. And even with that lack of detail, there were many that still came to Christ. Now, we don't necessarily have to think about, well, gosh, in order to evangelize effectively, I've got to know that Bible. I've got to be able to quote Scripture. I've got to carry that Bible with me everywhere I go. If you think about it, think about how much you know without having that Bible in front of you. Can't you defend what you believe and why you believe it? Can't you tell people there's a God? There's only one. And he created man who fell from sin or who fell into sin. And he promised a redeemer. And all of the Old Testament points to that redeemer and then the redeemer came. And what was it, the ba what is the basic premise of our belief? He came to die for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. How much simple is that? And did I quote a single scripture? No. You know more than you think that you do when it comes to your faith. Trust that when the time comes to give something to somebody and they start asking those questions, that you don't freeze up, that you just let the Holy Spirit just flow through you. That's the big thing. We're going to look at another thing that Paul addresses and how we should evangelize. And that's where we're going this week. Paul leaves Athens and continues his travels, teaching us another valuable lesson that we can add to those first two. Let's start off with Acts 18, verses 1 through 3. And after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. In Paul's day, Corinth was already an ancient city, and it was a commercial center because it was in the middle of two harbors. Corinth was a city with a remarkable reputation. It was for, uh, known for loose living, especially when it came to sexual immorality. In classic Greek, to act like a Corinthian meant to practice all forms of sexual immorality. A Corinthian companion, guess what that was? That was a prostitute. The sexual immorality that was there and permitted it was done under the goddess that they worshiped, which was Aphrodite, also known as Venus, the goddess of fertility and sexuality. And you see, in 146 BC, the uh, Corinth rebelled against the Romans and they totally destroyed this city. And in the day of Julius Caesar, he rebuilt it. And as soon as it was rebuilt, guess what? They went back to being Corinth. They were a city of sexual immorality. One ancient writer described Corinth as a town 
where none but the tough could survive. It kind of reminds me of, of maybe Chicago, St. Louis, Boston, San Francisco. Name a big city where you've got to be a little on the tough side to survive. Paul knew that because people from all over the empire passed through Corinth because it was between two harbors that he could set a strong church there. And guess what? It could touch lives all throughout the Roman Empire. Matthew 9, verses 35 and 36. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He knew Corinth was a tough city, but he, but he wasn't only interested in planting churches where they were easy. Paul knew, if I can get a leg in this city, even a little toe, it could make a huge difference. He knew it was a tough place. The Roman historian Suetonius wrote that Claudius banished Jews from Rome because of the dissension and disorder within the Jewish community. Because remember, Christianity was kept making its way throughout everything, and any time you got the Jews and Christians together, they clashed. And it was causing riots in the cities. It is quite possible that Aquila and Priscilla were already Christians when Paul met them. It's possible, but I'm not sure. Paul may have caught up with them because they were Jews and gave them the gospel. Their meeting began one of the most important relationships in the New Testament. If we look at Romans 16, verses 3 through 5a, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also to all the churches of the Gentiles. Also, greet the church that is in their house. If Paul is the one that brought them to Christ, they were strong in it. Apparently all three were tent makers. Now, a tent maker in those days, it just not, does not mean somebody that sews together tents for businesses or camping or what have you. A tent maker is a leather worker. Now, the leather workers of those days, it was something that, it's almost like Jesus when he's a carpenter. A carpenter is not just a guy that works with wood, but with stone. Same difference. Paul's tent making was an important part of his ministry. And it, it really ties in to how we view tent making today, which I'll get into in just a moment. Though he recognized his right to be supported by those we minister to, according to 1 Corinthians 9, verses 7 through 14, he voluntarily supported his own ministry and preaching work so that no one could look at him and say, you're only trying to make converts so that you can become rich. To me, that's just a silly thing to think about any Christian. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 17 and 18. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Today, tent making, and we know at least one tent maker, all of us know them. I'm not going to mention the names because you never know if this video will ever get out in those areas. But a tent maker has taken on a much broader definition than just referring to the skill of making tents. A tent maker is a dedicated, spiritually aware Christian man or woman who goes out in the world in a missionary field and guess what they do? They get into places where no one else could normally get into. And they use that business to reach people. Quietly. Like I said, we know one. They're working on that right now. Doing tea. What's that? They're doing tea. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're able to get into areas like Muslim areas. They're able to get into uh, uh, 
Buddhist area, you can just name the religion that's outside of God and Jesus. And they're able to get in and get that toe into their, their midst. And they're able to quietly spread the gospel at the same time. Acts 18, verses 4 and 5. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Now, Paul was effective as he reasoned, which is that he discussed and debated amongst the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogue. The Greeks present in the synagogue, were, they were Gentiles that were interested in Judaism, but more importantly, they were more interested in Jesus Christ. When Timothy came, he brought some news, some exciting news about the Christians and Thessalonica. They were remaining steadfast in the faith. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 6 through 10. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account, as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. To hear this news brought Paul great joy, and it spurred him on to continue. It really was an uplifting experience. Sometimes a pastor can work their butts off and not see any fruit. And it becomes discouraging. This was no different for Paul. Think about all the people that he's brought to Jesus Christ. And what has he faced every time? Well, he's chased out of cities. He's stoned, he's beaten, he's jailed for his efforts. He has had more people accept Christ but he doesn't know how they're doing. And he's kind of curious, I'm sure. But without cell phones, without computers or the internet or television, he actually has to wait for word to reach him or to get a letter so that he can hear. According to 2 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9, while Paul was in Corinth, financial support from Thessalonica came, which is why he was able to quit or postpone being a tent maker. He was able to go out and just give it all again. The gospel was once again rejected by most of the Jews though. Acts 18 verses 6 through 8. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard they were believing and being baptized. The blasphemy that they were giving had to have been against Jesus. How dare you say that this man is God? We only know one God. And that's the crater of heaven and earth. This is an indirect declaration of the deity of Jesus because someone can only really blaspheme God. It's amazing to think about that. You can talk bad about Jesus all you want, but you can only blaspheme God. Paul strongly says his responsibility to preach to the Jews first. But when his message was rejected, he wasted no time in going straight to the Gentiles. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. When people are determined to reject the gospel, 
we shouldn't keep trying to deliver it to them because they are not ready to listen to it. You have to wait till that door is opened again, which is why, once again, we need to reflect Christ in all circumstances. Just like he and Barnabas did when they left Iconium, Paul shook out his garments this time, not just the dust off his feet. This was a dramatic way of expressing his rejection of their rejection. Paul was certainly capable of dramatic and vivid demonstrations of his message. Paul treated the Jews of Corinth with love and grace and mercy, though. Even after they rejected him, any Jew that came to him and wanted to know about Christ, he didn't say, nope, you didn't want to know him, get out of here. No, he sat there and told him about, it any, about Jesus anyways. All he did was just merely stretch, or move his focus from Jews to Gentiles only. That was his main focus. 1 Corinthians 1, 14a. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus. Crispus was the leader of the synagogue who believed, and so did his entire household. I really think that, that Crispus' acceptance of Christ, it was an encouragement for others to do so. After all, he's the leader of the synagogue, and they were able to do it without fear. Acts 18, verses 9 through 11. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. God had to send a vision to him because apparently Paul was becoming afraid. He was beginning, becoming worried about, gosh, am I going to face more of this persecution? And God had to come and tell him in a dream and a vision, don't be afraid. Well, what was his solution? It was for Paul's fear to put it aside and obey Jesus. Just obey his command to not be afraid. And this was the premise behind this scripture. The solution to Paul's fear to obey Jesus and to, spoke, and to speak boldly to everybody. Wouldn't it be nice if we would just do the same? Not be afraid? Not be worried about anyone making fun of us? Or riling up a crowd and say, yeah, just chase this person away? Paul did not stop doing what he would do. Anybody that tried to stop him, they weren't going to be successful at all. So Paul was no longer afraid. Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This was the promise. God was fulfilling and living up to the promise again. Isaiah was a long time ago. God never lies. He's only told the truth. When we understand what this means and take it to heart, and we understand who says it, it is enough. The additional promise was a constant assurance to Paul, who must have had often had doubts about the, the survival and health of the Corinthian church. And remember, this is a very immoral place. But Paul stayed there for a year and a half. That's the longest he's ever been in a place other than where he grew up. His ministry at Corinth described just how much of an evangelist he was. He was not, I'm going to come in and out and be gone and leave you to your own devices. He was wholeheartedly invested in this. He wasn't just going to spread, spit the message and run. He was going to stay there and make sure that everybody was fed, encouraged, and built up. He was more, important, or more committed to making disciples than he was anything else. Acts 18, verses 12 through 17. But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. 
But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a, a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about the words and names about and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Apparently when Crispus was the leader and trusted in Jesus, he was replaced as the ruler of the synagogue by Sothenes, who later himself seems to have become a Christian according to 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul called an apostle, apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sothenes our brother. Paul may have seen a little bit of himself in this guy. Remember, Paul was there chasing all the Christians and trying to put them to death and in jail. He was there holding the cloaks while they stoned Stephen. So here he is trying to get Paul beat and punished by the Romans, and it doesn't succeed. So Paul may have said, I understand where you're coming from, dude, really. And somewhere along the lines, the influence must have turned him to a Christian. In approaching Gallio, the Jews of Corinth tried to stop Paul's preaching uh, work in the entire province. We don't want it passed about to anybody. Before Paul could defend himself, Gallio did it for him. Now what a wonderful thing. He correctly saw that the government had no role in attempting to decide religious matters, although it does have a legitimate role in matters of, of wrongdoing or vicious crimes. Don't you kind of wish that our governments today would take that own advice? They claim that they want to have separation of church and state, but they really don't. Only when it's more beneficial for them. Gallio, he looked the other way when the angry Gentiles beat Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue. He didn't care. Probably both the crowd and Gallio himself were more against the Jews than they were for Paul. Acts 18.18 18. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. And Contraria, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Unlike previous uh, cities, Paul wasn't forced out. He wasn't chased out. He wasn't in prison, none of the above. He stayed until he thought the work was done. And when he left, the two went with him. And I'm sure that Timothy and Silas were there as well. They all went together. And they went because Paul had developed such a deep friendship with Aquila and Priscilla. He decided to go head back east of Jerusalem and then up to Antioch. It says that Paul had taken a vow. This was most likely the vow of a Nazarite as described in uh, number six. The purpose of the vow of a Nazarite was to express a unique consecration to God, promising to abstain from all products from the grapevine and not to cut their hair and to never come near a dead body. When the vow was complete, the hair would be shaved off and offered uh, to the Lord at a special ceremony along with uh, a peace offering in the, at the temple in Jerusalem. But Paul's performance of this vow shows that he wasn't necessarily worried about waiting to get to Jerusalem to shave all the hair off. And it shows that the Jewish opposition to his preaching had not made him not Jewish. He was still a Jew. He never forgot that he was Jewish, his Messiah was Jewish, and that Christianity is really comes from the Jewish faith. And that the Old Testament forms and rituals might still be used to a good purpose. Apparently, though, Paul was adamant that Jewish ceremonies and rituals, even though, even though they were not required for Christians to follow, it was still sometimes good to follow it. By tradition, a Nazarite vow could only be fulfilled in Judea. So guess where he's headed? 
He's headed back to Jerusalem. But he cut his hair off early, which means he had to keep it in a, a bag or somehow keep it wrapped up where he didn't lose any. But he still wanted to do that final thing in Jerusalem, that final offering and that peace offering on top of it, according to, to tradition. Acts 18, verses 19 through 21. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Remember, Paul really wanted to preach in Ephesus some two years earlier. But if you remember, according to Acts 16.6, 6, they passed through uh, uh, Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now the Holy Spirit says, you can go there and preach. And great results are seen. God has a special thing about timing, you know, in our lives. And if Paul could have discerned it, the Holy Spirit was really saying at that time, just wait. Just wait. It's not time. When he wanted to go to Ephesus instead of no. Sometimes God says wait, and he always knows what he's doing uh, when it says it in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Sometimes we don't really pay attention to that. We don't pay attention to that God is in control and not us. And sometimes God tells us to wait as well. Yes. Aquila and Priscilla, now they stayed in Ephesus seemingly at Paul's request. And I'm pretty sure that Silas and Timothy stayed there as well. Something good started at Ephesus. And Paul wanted to work, wanted the work to continue with his trusted friends. Paul could not stay long in Ephesus after shaving his head because why? The festival was coming up. And he wanted to be back in Jerusalem for that festival to present that hair. Acts 18.22 When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. When it says that Paul had gone up and greeted the church, it means that he went up to Jerusalem and fulfilled his vow. He finished what he wanted to do. Then leaving Jerusalem, Paul returned to his home church in Syrian Antioch. He might be taking a little break here just for a short time frame, and he's gonna probably tell them, and you won't believe all the great things that's happened on this second missionary journey that I took. They must have been pleased to have Paul return and tell of all this work over the previous three years. Can you imagine? They know Corinthian, uh, Corinth is around, and to hear what took place in Corinth, do you think that church is celebrating? I think they were. Acts 18.23, And having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Pergia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, we, it's not really said how long he stayed there at home and giving that congregation the encouragement and building them up and showing them what God's been doing. Since Paul's first focus on the trip was strengthening all the disciples, he went back to all the churches that they'd already founded and the previous missionary works. And this would include the congregations in Tarsus and Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, Pisidian, and Antioch. Paul's passion for building disciples, not merely making converts, was again evident. The work was important to him. No different than us today. If Paul were to come and visit our church or any of the churches around here, what kind of questions do you think he'd be asking because he'd want to know? How strong of a disciple are you? What can I do to strengthen your walk with Jesus Christ? He would remind us all that it isn't enough to make a strong beginning with Jesus, but we must always be growing in strength. That means that we are not only to share our faith and lead others to Christ, but we are also to establish 
to establish them so that they will get rooted in the Christian faith. Col or Colossians 2, verses 6, uh, through 6 and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. The goal of establishing a new or young believer is to help him or her get rooted in the Christian faith and connected with the, with the community of believers so they can continue to learn. Your willingness to help out new believers around you to get rooted in their faith flows out of your love for God and for the love of His people. This is why I have always said I had such an issue with Billy Graham. He was great at leading people to Christ, but at that time there was no set thing set up so that those that accepted Christ could have a, founding, a grounding foundation to work with. That's where Graham Franklin turned it around. He's the one that helped get all the churches involved and say, when they come, plug them into your churches. Acts 18, verses 24 through 26 say, Now a Jew named Apollos, now remember this is the first time we hear about this guy, and we hear about him later on. A, now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. It seems that Apollos was a missionary, just like a lot of the other folks were in those days. They were sent out and called by God alone. It wasn't like Paul when they got to all the, the other apostles and they sent out. Because remember, a lot of those Christians, when they were being persecuted originally, they dispersed throughout the region. And they were missionaries. They weren't called by God to be. This guy had to have been called by God alone because we have no indication that he was sent or commissioned like Paul was by any specific congregation. He simply came to Ephesus. And just look at his qualities. He was an eloquent man. He was mighty in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. Now fervent here, the, the original word means that he is, he is literally to boil in the spirit with the idea of bubbling over with enthusiasm. This guy was just beside himself. He was bouncing. If he got to talking about God, he was just everywhere all at once. And, he was the kind of guy that got you excited to be right along with him. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things about Jesus, even though he only knew of what John the Baptist was teaching at the time. He didn't know who Jesus was personally. He'd never met him. But because he knew of what John was teaching. He knew that we have to repent, come back to the Lord. He knows that Jesus has already come and gone. Repent and turn to Jesus. He may not have known much about Jesus, but what he did know, he taught accurately. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that he taught it accurately and boldly with passion that truly excited him which I'm sure excited everybody else around him. It's almost like there's times when I get so excited when I'm preaching and I'm just bouncing, and you guys just, I can see you in the seats and you're getting excited and, and going right along with it. How can we not know Jesus or know him and not be excited to tell about him? Acts 18, verses 26b through 28. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, 
He greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Aquila and Priscilla did something that's valuable in God's kingdom. They helped someone who had a passion for God and at least some power in serving him, yet he had a limited knowledge and therefore limited resources for a truly effective ministry. And what did they do? They took him under their wing and taught him everything about Jesus. Now he's got a complete picture. He was now fully prepared to go and make disciples and provide a solid argument against the Jews in Achaia. When Apollos went to the region of Achaia, it probably means that he went to the city of Corinth in the region of Achaia. From what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he apparently had a remarkable ministry there. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 through 9. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Apollos went to Corinth to water what Paul had planted. Though some Corinthians fixated on Apollos in a divisive spirit according to 1 Corinthians 1.12 and 1 Corinthians 3.4, there is no reason to believe that Apollos himself encouraged any of this. All of the teaching he received and leading of the Holy Spirit was effective as Paul regarded Apollos as a trusted colleague according to 1 Corinthians 3.5. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave you opp gave opportunity to each one. And this is the wish that I have for all of us, that we take the teaching we received and ask the Holy Spirit into our lives so we, like Paul and Apollos, can go out into the world and be effective in delivering the gospel fearlessly to all. The examples uh, for that have been set that Paul taught were reflect, reflect Christ no matter what. No matter what circumstances you face, trust in God, trust in Jesus, know that you are covered by the blood and reflect him so that others can come and ask. When they do come and ask, why are you so different? Give it to them in terms they can understand. You don't have to preach scripture. You don't have to beat them with the Bible. All you have to do is tell them what they want to know in terms that are simplistic enough for them to understand. Finally, encourage and mentor them. To me, that's one of the most important keys to all of this. To mentor and give them strength to stand strong in the face of the adversary or adversities that they're going to face. Build up that courage in them to let them know it's okay. It's okay if your friends don't want to be your friends anymore. Because guess what? There's other people out there that want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. Every time we look at what Paul's doing, it continues to build us up. Let's go to prayer.